My name is Kelly Toomey, and my research within the Weber Energy Group at the University of Texas explores the intricate relationship between energy and water. Today, I will focus specifically on the energy and water quality consequences associated with first-generation biofuels. This podcast is intended to give you a brief introduction to one of the ways that first-generation biofuel production is promoting practices that degrade water quality in the United States and may inadvertently increase the energy we need to bring that water back up to an acceptable level to drink. As we move forward through the 21st century, the ways by which we moderate the intricate relationship between energy and freshwater resources will affect our continued security, economy, and environmental health. We refer to this relationship as the energy-water nexus, since it takes a lot of water to produce energy, and likewise, a lot of energy to treat water. The energy-water nexus is important in the production of electricity, as a lot of water is necessary to cool power plants. However, in this podcast, we will focus on the water quality and energy implications of producing biofuels. In 2007, the Energy Independence and Security Act was passed as a response to growing concerns over rising fuel prices, national security, and the environment. This legislation incrementally increases the volume of renewable fuel required to be blended into gasoline from 9 billion gallons in 2008 to 36 billion gallons in 2022, up to 15 billion gallons of which will be permitted to come from cornstarch-based ethanol. Consequently, the production of cornstarch-based ethanol has grown exponentially in the past few years and is expected to reach the 15 billion gallon cap much earlier than 2022. One consequence of ramped up biofuels production, particularly in the case of traditional first generation biofuels, such as cornstarch based ethanol and soy derived biodiesel, is the risk of downstream water pollution caused by the soil runoff from agricultural land. This runoff, potentially laden with nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers and pesticides detrimentally impacts water quality. Several analyses indicate that the Energy Independence and Security Act will likely increase nitrogen loading by 10 to 30 percent. In addition to the environmental impacts to aquatic life, nitrate contaminated water raises serious health concerns. To address these health concerns, highly energy-intensive water treatments must be used to treat contaminated water. Conventional water treatment methods such as boiling, filtration, disinfection, and water softening have no effect in removing nitrate from drinking water. Therefore, advanced treatment processes are needed that can effectively reverse the process of dilution and return contaminants back to their concentrated form. Although there are several treatment processes that are effective in the removal of nitrate, including membrane treatments, ion exchange methods, and electrochemical methods, they come with a significant energy cost. As this plot shows, treatment processes effective for nitrate removal may require anywhere from 3,000 to 30,000 kilowatt hours per million gallons of water, depending on the quality of the source water. In 1994, an estimated 500,000 people drank from 55 public water supply systems that exceeded the Environmental Protection Agency's limit for nitrate. Assuming that the average person uses 140 gallons of potable water a day, this amounts to 25.6 billion gallons of water that was delivered through public supply systems without meeting acceptable drinking water standards. For more information on my research, please visit www.weberenergygroup.com. Special thanks to Ashlyn Stilwell for her collaboration on this work. Feel free to come back to our website, weberenergygroup.com, for more updates on all our students' research, our latest publications, and the things we're up to these days.